So, uh, so thank you so much for uh, having the conference online. Uh, obviously, uh, we were looking forward to seeing you all in Reykjavik, but uh, maybe next time, who knows? And uh, uh, we are now talking about, uh, what I'm going to talk about is the new process that started uh, last year. And, you know, really thanks to Felix for, uh, you know, a really interesting talk. And, uh, and then Jon will talk about sort of more the academic angle and sort of the big picture of the process. But I'm going to uh, dive straight into sort of the civic tech uh, uh, aspects of things. So, uh, uh, see. So uh, the Citizens Foundation is a nonprofit, and we uh, our mission is to uh, connect uh, governments and nonprofits with citizens. And uh, we are developing uh, state-of-the-art not-for-profit engagement platforms and technologies. And we were founded as a direct response of the financial crisis in uh, 2008, and now have offices in Iceland, uh, the U.S., and the U.K. And uh, we have uh, helped uh, improve decision making and in literally hundreds of projects in, 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 in 20 countries, and amongst others, uh, Petr Reykjavik, and we are working with the Scottish Parliament on their Engage project, and we've been doing a, a lot of participatory budgeting. I know there's been a lot of talk uh, often in, in, you know, over the years in TikTok about PP, and uh, we've been doing it mostly in Iceland, uh, and now after it's become sort of a part of the democratic culture in the, uh, you know, in the city, in Reykjavik, in Kopovor, in all the cities around, the, uh, you know, Reykjavik, we are now constant, you know, consistently the past three years uh, getting always over 12% participation rate. And the record, you know, recent record is 19%. So using online uh, solutions, we're actually, you know, reaching mass participation in online democracy. And we least we believe in, uh, you know, non-partisanship, we're totally non-partisanship, and, uh, and then sort of future solutions and, uh, and using technology for good. So uh, last year, uh, the uh, parliament started a new process uh, uh, on changing the constitution. And so, uh, as, as discussed, the process from 2010 to 2013, it uh, didn't really, uh, 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 you know, get, go to a conclusion. Uh, that constitution draft was never ratified. So, uh, uh, a committee of all the leaders of all the political parties uh, started this process in a nonpartisan way. And the Citizens Foundation with the University of Iceland uh, uh, has been uh, uh, helping out uh, uh, with uh, engaging the, the public. And we used uh, uh, effectively four different channels of engagement. We did uh, online deliberation with our open source Your Priorities platform, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, we also created an education game to give people a high level view of constitution making. Then we used Facebook and YouTube to actually reach people. We used paid campaigns to uh, let people know about this. And then there was a deliberative poll, a type of a citizen assembly uh, that was uh, 300 people came together over a weekend uh, to discuss with experts and amongst themselves. And uh, so your priorities, uh, it's a simple tool uh, being developed and redeveloped and rewritten over the past 11 years, simple interface for adding ideas and have a deliberation about those ideas. And then you can sort of vote the points up and down. And the key sort of innovation and what's really made it work for us is that it's, it doesn't have a regular commenting system, but it has like a deliberation system that really makes it really impractical to argue. And uh, I will show you a you know, screenshot in a minute. And uh, also we are asking citizens to uh, evaluate the ideas. We are not asking them to come up with the first thing that pops into their mind. We're asking them, so what's good about this idea? What's bad about it? So that seems to also help in terms of sort of nudging people into uh, you know, a bit of a, a you know, more of an evalu evaluate remote. And uh, uh, the minority and majority views also have equal weight in the user interface. So, so if, even if there's a small minority that has some points against something, their points are at the same level as the points for. And uh, we use quite a bit of artificial intelligence and machine learning in our platforms, including machine translations, recommendations, speech to text, uh, people can speak in the right ears, we detect toxicity automatically and use uh, natural language processing, including for uh, creating, uh, this is coming out soon, uh, creating 3D maps of, uh, of ideas that are similar. So you can sort of visualize clusters of similar ideas in the case if you have thousands of tens of thousands of ideas coming from the public. And the key outcomes using a platform like this is uh, effectively uh, uh, better decisions. And, uh, you know, using collective intelligence, you know, to uh, deal with an ever more complex world. And, you know, I'm sure uh, uh, 
Civic Tech will play a role in, you know, helping, uh, you know, giving the world's response to the current crisis. And uh, so, uh, so here is a screenshot of the constitution process. Uh, this is uh, helpfully uh, machine translated from uh, from Icelandic to English. And even if uh, Icelandic, I mean, we are 360,000 people. It's it, it's a minority, super minority language. Even you know, trans, you know, translation from Google. Uh, using Google Translate over to uh, English works surprisingly well. And the key thing for this consultation is, uh, uh, you know, when we're designing it is that, you know, when you talk to somebody on the street, you ask them, oh, so what do you think about the constitution? Can you provide something to it? Or can you tell us something about it? Many people are like, oh, you know, they, they, they really can't uh, even, uh, you know, start to think about what the constitution is thinking. It's a very complex legal document. I mean, it is, but it's actually amongst the more simple legal documents you have. And then when you start to break down the constitution into uh, more sort of manageable chunks to understand, and obviously use photos, uh, that's very important, uh, then uh, you are able to actually, you know, things like, should we collectively own our resources together? I mean, a lot of people will have a view on that, even if they would not have a view on a general big document of a constitution. So here you have different groups. You have the you know, constituencies, natural resources, uh, direct democracy, the presidency, and then I, I choose one of the groups, and then I have different ideas uh, that then people can debate. So should we have national referendum on controversial issues? Um, uh, should MPs be able to, uh, uh, you know, force a national referendum? Um, you know, should Iceland be one constituency or not? Um, and uh, and so on and so on. And uh, and this was one of the most popular categories uh, about national resources. And uh, so you see the ideas at the bottom. So if I click on the ownership of resources, so here's the idea that is actually uh, one part of the legal document. This is just a tiny pop, you know, part of it. It's just one article in it. And so people then uh, um, have the idea, and then they can add points for or points against on uh, on on each side of the screen, and uh, it's uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know provide the comments, and, and this goes on and on. Here's another one, if Iceland should be one constituency or not. There's a link at the, that's link included in the schedule, but also at the end of the presentation, which actually you can uh, look at this yourself using Google Translate and, and uh, you know, sort of dive into what Iceland thinks about the uh, you know, constitutions. And then quickly on, uh, on, uh, on uh, gamification, also with the University of Iceland, we, uh, uh, we uh, worked on developing a, a game uh, called Make Your Constitution, and with the idea of, uh, you know, I mean, people have been talking a lot about the National Resources article in Iceland for many, many years, for decades, actually, and, uh, it, and we thought maybe we can, uh, at least for some people who are interested in politics and so on, maybe we can give them a little game that will uh, uh, show them sort of the high level of constitution making. And so we created this game, which is basically about helping people you know, demonstrate to citizens uh, how their values affect policy choices. So you go into a game, you have a little quiz where you can answer questions about uh, constitution making and you can collect choice points. Then you choose a country that you want to make a constitution for. This is Iceland, but you could also make a constitution for I I Iran in 1979, just after the uh, you know, revolution. So uh, you're not necessarily making a constitution for yourself. You're making a constitution for a country that you choose. And then you select articles you want to use, and uh, then you're in the game. And, uh, and you uh, uh, basically, uh, different articles uh, cost uh, different choice points. And if you select articles into your constitution that, uh, that fits with the cultural values of, of, the, of the country that you're making a constitution for, you can get bonuses. So it's actually like constitution making via slot machine mechanics, if you like. But it's fun and we've, it's been tried in the university as a teaching material and, and people really like it. And then when you've made your, when you've finished your constitution, uh, you uh, uh, have all the articles and then you get like a quick review on it. So, and just a couple of slides on uh, the results of uh, the initial uh, process results. I mean, I mean, we were here, we were gonna talk about more uh, issues uh, about where it was actually in the parliament now, but there is no parliament except COVID parliament. You know, all business of parliament has been canceled except for COVID-19. So. So, so the only results we have is actually what the process was. So we had over 39,000 citizens visited the website and, and looked at uh, an average of three constitution ideas and uh, close to 1,100 uh, contributed directly. 
and you know Iceland is tiny, so it's, it's thousand. The U.S. is thousand times uh, bigger. So, so if this was U.S. number, there'd be thirty nine million citizens participating with over one million contributing materials. So we spent over uh, uh, forty thousand to promote the project on Facebook and YouTube, and we could have used more targeting, but you know for this sort of project, we sort of all just need to target everybody. And uh, finally, uh, we did. Uh, uh, compared the uh, toxicity on the different platforms. We had data from Facebook, your priorities on the delivery call, and we used an automated way, perspective API, which is uh, a, 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 a way of uh, detecting toxicity in text. And uh, we had ourselves uh, experienced actually a quite a lot, of, a lot of toxicity on Facebook while we were promoting the project. Some people were calling us traitors and so on and uh, for not doing something or why we were doing this project with the government and so on. But we had a, a, a but then when we got the results, we saw after looking at all the different comments, only 3.8% of Facebook comments were toxic or very toxic, but with a lot of lower numbers on, uh, on your priorities and, and the delivery to polls. So in our mind, we had seen a lot of toxic comments, but there was actually not that much. And when it comes to a uh, very toxic comment, then, uh, then uh, in the delivery to polls, there were none, they were almost done in your priorities and only very few uh, also uh, on Facebook, which I think is a, is a good thing. And so uh, we have uh, uh, set up a, a deliberation, your priorities group uh, for the session where you can ask questions uh, as well, uh, you know, sort of asynchronously, even tomorrow or the other day. And it also has links to all the software, to the open source software, to the raw data for uh, uh, the data analysis of toxicity. And, uh, you know, thank you so much and, uh, and I welcome any questions later. Thank you so much, Robert. That was uh, super interesting and so much information in such a short space of time. So I'm sure there'll be lots and lots of questions and people, uh, people reaching out. Um, right, so quickly, I'm your co-presenter, uh, Professor John Olafson, um, if, you want to, uh, if you want to go ahead and then we've got about 10 minutes for questions at the end. Okay, yes, thanks. Uh, I'll just share my screen with you. Uh, so let me see. Um, Uh, yeah. Um, let me see. So, do you see my screen? Yep, you can see. Okay, great. Good. Uh, so, I'm going to pick up where uh, Robert finished. Um, you have heard a lot about the Icelandic uh, constitution saga already. Uh, um, it all started just after the financial crisis in 2008 with uh, an election to a, a, a constituent assembly, which then was reorganized into a constitutional council, uh, which produced very quickly a new draft constitution uh, with uh, quite a lot of, of public input, as, as Felix described. But uh, this project failed for, for several different reasons. Uh, um, the, uh, the, the parliament uh, was not able really to pass it before the term ended in 2013, uh, which uh, came with quite uh, drastic uh, political changes in Iceland. So uh, now, uh, a couple of years ago, the new government uh, decided to embark on a second attempt. It's less ambitious, I should say, in, in terms of uh, uh, transparency and, and public involvement in actually writing a new constitution, but it's perhaps more important in this, uh, more ambitious, I would want to say, in the sense of, uh, of actually uh, trying to revise the constitution uh, with uh, certain well-organized uh, public involvement. So the idea was really to uh, use uh, state-of-the-art engagement methods and not only one but to mix uh, several. So the methods that we have been using and, and I have been involved in this as, as an academic, uh, we were asked at the University of Iceland to to help uh, design the process. Um, and the idea is to, on the one hand, we have been, uh, uh, apart from the project that uh, Robert has just described, the crowdsourcing project, where people are actually invited to, 
uh, to put uh, forth their ideas about certain issues in the constitution. We conducted a deliberative poll, which uh, I'm sure many of you know what it is. It, it, deliberative polls have been uh, conducted uh, for a number of years, uh, and they uh, mix uh, uh, traditional survey with very well organized face-to-face -face deliberation meetings. And the idea with the deliberative poll is to get the statistically, statistically significant results about the considered views of the public rather than just raw opinions. So the idea is that you actually improve on the ordinary opinion poll by inviting people to come together and uh, discuss the ideas, uh, understand better uh, the trade-offs that they would be uh, willing to uh, accept and so on and so forth. So the uh, the deliberative meeting is very similar to the uh, to the national forum that was uh, convened uh, before the uh, the uh, constitutional council started uh, in 2011, but it is uh, approached in a much more methodical way. Uh, we both uh, uh, survey uh, the participants before they deliberate and after, and we keep uh, um, very detailed records of the conversations, actually. So what we hope to accomplish with that, using both the crowdsourcing uh, um, results, uh, results from uh, the deliberative meeting where more than 200 people actually took part, and on measuring the changes in the views about the constitution that we can uh, see happening over the period uh, of the deliberative poll, makes it possible to, um, to design uh, a new constitutional bill based on uh, public input to a considerable extent. So, so the crowdsourcing exercise provides the open access platform uh, and uh, the, uh, the deliberative poll uh, provides the face-to-face -face deliberation. One is, of course, self-selected. Uh, the participants in the deliberative meeting and the face-to-face -face deliberation are, are randomly selected. So, uh, so the mission really is uh, to, uh, to run this um, multiple face-to-face -face, uh, and uh, the, the online democratic innovation uh, with national government. And, what we, what we also need to do, and I think this is a, a, an issue which is very important in any kind of, of public engagement, the officials also have to be trained to understand and appreciate the input made by individuals and civil society organizations. What we have seen, and I think this is uh, in particular the experience of the Constitutional Council Constitution draft, is that it's often very difficult for people who are deeply involved in um, public administration to actually take seriously and understand the kind of writing and the kind of proposals that you get from the public. Uh, one of the criticisms of the constitutional draft in 2011 was uh, that uh, it mixed uh, traditions in constitution making and many specialists about constitutions found that difficult to accept. Uh, there were very well defined reasons for that in the explanations written by the Constitutional Council, but it was difficult for specialists and officials really to work with that. So uh, we need uh, to use the methods we have to help them understand the difference between uh, special interest influence making, which they are used to and deal with all the time, and open and empowering involvement by the public, which they should uh, uh, be more able to understand. So there is an epistemic challenge here, which we are uh, working to overcome. First, we need to ensure diversity and inclusion. Uh, of course, participatory projects are not very useful unless they attract uh, wide and equal participation. But it is also very important to appeal to the different groups in society and to use the different skills uh, and perspectives that we have not only from the general public, but also from special interest groups, uh, from uh, 
experts as well as from the officials and uh, and the elected officials so there is a balance uh, to be found between empowerment and effectiveness again going back to 2011 the constitution council then uh, was really empowered it could do whatever it wanted to do but it failed to be effective so that's a lesson to be learned uh, what can we do to uh, to, to keep the balance uh, uh, right so that uh, the citizens who are involved feel empowered, but that they are also uh, effective, that what they propose is also really going to have an impact on what is then really done. Now, we have been dealing also with what uh, I would like to call the activist practicant gap. Uh, Robert briefly mentioned that uh, the government has not uh, quite been able to win the trust of the public that the failure of the former project uh, created. Uh, so uh, we have been accused of, you know, selling out to the government. But the fact is that we have uh, a gap between those who are uh, activists, who are constitutional activists and who want to go very far, and those who are prepared to take the smaller steps. So this is also something that we need to address. How can we uh, make these groups somehow work together as well. Uh, now, the question is this, uh, can uh, crowdsourced proposals be made alive and relevant to public administration and elected officials? And I think that's really the challenge of a project now, not only to conduct the experiments that we have described, but also to, um, to follow up on them. Uh, we have to and that's also one thing that the academia, that the university can do to actually uh, follow up on the ways that you can, uh, you can put the or bring the input of the public into the actual constitutional proposals or bills. So let me just end with this. Uh, we are running a three year uh, research project, which is very much part of this constitutional revision. It's called Democratic Constitutional Design. And uh, you see the link there, so I think I'm going to stop here. Thanks.